Let me start today with a story, a true story that's going to relate to our, our passage today we're going to look at in, in the Bible. And I want to tell you the, the story of uh, John Wesley, the great and, and esteemed founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley. Um, he, uh, at the time of, during his life, the Methodist movement boasted, I think it was 120,000 followers. He himself traveled 250,000 miles on horseback and preached over 40,000 sermons. He was a powerful and gifted individual. Uh, God had a real plan for his life. He had a very adventurous life, actually. And, um, but he was, he was also uh, very fortunate to be alive because when he was a small boy, some local people took a disliking to their family and set their house on fire. And uh, everyone evacuated the house in the middle of the night, but they forgot John Wesley up in the highest room of the house, almost like a home alone situation. They forgot him, and they're all outside. The house is on fire, and they all concluded, it's too late. We've lost him. And then he, he woke up surrounded by fire, and he managed to find his way to the window, and several men in the community got together, and they stood on each other's shoulders to reach up to the highest window, got him out safely. It seemed that God really had a plan and a purpose for his life. John Wesley, though, was known as kind of a legalistic person, a real legalistic temperament, had a lot of rules and regulations. He grew up in a very devout Anglican family. He was born in 1703, and he was raised uh, with a lot of strong, a strong sense of discipline, being a very disciplined person. And when he was a young man, he went to Oxford University, and with some like-minded friends, they started the Holy Club. The Holy Club. And as the name suggests, the Holy Club was an exclusive group with, with, with very strict, rigid uh, rules to adhere to. All the members that belonged to this club had particular things they had to follow and had to do to be a part of this holy club. And John Wesley, with his meticulous personality and his meticulous nature, really took to these, this rule following very well and was the big driving force behind the holy club. Well, their numbers grew, they attracted people, but they also attracted criticism as well. People, some people praised them for their devotion, saying, wow, look how devoted they are to, to, to Christianity, to Christ. But others criticized them and said, well, they seem really narrow-minded and, and very rigid and very legalistic. And John Wesley ended up with a reputation of being somebody uh, very, un, well, very unwavering, but also very uncompromising and very stern. While his, this worldview, this legalistic worldview, really was challenged on a very fateful day. One day, uh, he's crossing the Atlantic. It was in 1735. He had taken on the role or the position, the, the calling of, of a missionary. So he was, he was sent to uh, a British colony of uh, the British colony of Georgia. He was traveling across the Atlantic, and they hit this, this really bad storm. And John Wesley was terrified in the midst of this storm. He had no certainty. I mean, he, he was afraid of dying, but it was more than that. He had no certainty that he would. Actually, he knew God and that, that he would be saved and uh, that he would make it to heaven, basically. And so, he, he, but then there were these other Christians there, these Moravian Christians, who were another group of missionaries. Moravian Christians are an amazing group in history. If you ever study uh, the history of the church, the Moravian group are very inspiring. But he, he saw these other Moravian Christians and they had a, a quiet confidence to them. In the midst of this storm, when everyone could have lost their life, they had this quiet confidence that he absolutely lacked. And he in comparison to them, he realized there was something missing from his own faith. And this experience caused massive doubts in him about the nature of salvation and about his own salvation. He couldn't shake this feeling of insecurity afterwards. He, he had no assurance that he was a child of God by grace. And he returned home. He, he, I think he abandoned the trip. He, he, he eventually returned. He was there for a while, but I think he eventually returned home, and he concluded that his life and ministry had failed. How would John Wesley get the breakthrough, the true understanding that he needed? Let's pause the story there. We'll get to it, uh, the conclusion of it, at the end of the sermon. So we're in our series right now called The Real Jesus, and this is a journey through the gospel of, 
uh, Mark. We've uh, got a slide right here. It's an adventure through the Gospel of Mark. And uh, if you have missed any of these, you can go to try.church slash Mark and catch up there, M-A-R-K. And um, basically, the, the verses will come up on the screen. We're going to be in chapter 2, verse 23 in just a minute. We have free Bibles as well in our pew, so use one of those. And if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take it home with you. Um, and we have to look at, the reason we're looking at the Gospels is because that's how we find the real Jesus, the Jesus who lived and walked this earth, the Jesus who had friends and his friends wrote about him. There's no other Jesus than that Jesus. So uh, let's pray and then let's turn to Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Lord, I thank you that you're with us today. Thank you that you're keeping us warm. And I just pray for, I pray for safety for everyone against the ice and the, the the extreme cold, and, uh, but Lord, we also pray that you would do a deep spiritual work in our hearts today, that you would teach us from your word, that you would transform us, that you would help us to understand your grace and your love and how we're to follow you, how we're to trust you. Lord, we, we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's, let's read here. It says, one Sabbath... He, that's Jesus, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is God's Word. Well, Jesus is being tested again by the, the religious, the, the dominant religious group of his day, the, the Pharisees. They're, uh, they're kind of supposed to be in charge of all re things religion, all things uh, Jewish. And uh, they're, they're, he's, you know, they're keeping an eye on Jesus because seemingly everything he does is, is not up to their expectations or their standards or, their, or what they think uh, should be done. So they're keeping a close eye on Jesus. And there's this ongoing tension that is growing in the Gospels. As you read through the Gospels, as we read through the Gospel of Mark, we see more and more tension building between Jesus and these religious elites. It's, it gets so bad that in the end, that's why they crucify him, because uh, they can't stand what he's doing. They can't stand his his interpretations, they can't stand ultimately that the people follow Jesus and not them. And it just reminds us of the human heart, of our own hearts and other people's hearts. We can never be naive to this or forget this, but when people lose their power, when people lose their place in life, when people lose their status, they're willing to kill innocent people over it. This is the human condition, and we see it here in these religious Leaders, And so the controversy that they're facing in this moment is the Sabbath, the Sabbath rest, taking one day off uh, a week. And uh, in, to be, you know, in this time, to be, to be Jewish, even now, to be Orthodox Jew, there's really two big things that are really identified uh, with the religion. It's uh, the Sabbath and circumcision, right? Those, those are the two big things. Actually, no other religions have these two things. No other religions have them. Have the Sabbath and have circumcision. Circumcision came later on. So you could argue that the Sabbath is even more important of the two. It came from the very beginning, right? We're told in Genesis, God made everything in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. That's the Sabbath. It comes very early on in the Bible. And you could almost say to be Jewish is to follow the Sabbath. I mean, it's more than just that. But this is how important the Sabbath was. In fact, the, of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is the longest commandment. And also, it's the one that more regulations were built around than any other commandment that God had given them. If you're going to take the writings of Moses seriously, if you're going to take the Torah, the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, if you're going to take them seriously, if you're going to be devout, 
you are going to be obsessed with the Sabbath. You're going to care greatly about the Sabbath and observe it. I cannot overestimate and and I cannot explain enough how much of their religion revolved around properly understanding and following the rituals of the Sabbath. This was a huge deal. And so for Jesus to be a little slack on the Sabbath, it's not just that it offended them because they thought it was important. They thought it was immoral. This is immoral that Jesus would do this. And this is hard for us to comprehend uh, in one sense. It's hard for us because we live in a, we really live in a very uh, non-traditional society, don't we? I mean, some people, depending on where you've grown up exactly or where your, your background is, uh, maybe if you're from, a, from another country, uh, you might understand this, this sentiment a little bit better. But I'd say you know, in America, our society, we, we tend to tear down traditions. We tend to uh, defy the rules, right? You know, somebody in authority, and say, you know, we don't tend to honor authority, we tend to mock authority, or we don't you know, tend to pr- preserve the things of the past, we want to transform the things of the past, right? Like, we, we, we're not very good at understanding this, so let me help get us into the mindset of, of a, why the Pharisees are so offended and so bothered by this. Uh, we all have pet peeves, don't we? We all have things that we value, things that we think are important, we get bothered that other people don't do them right, or that change them. So let's say uh, you're a steak lover, right? You love steak, but you see someone eating steak with ketchup. Is that okay with you? Do you get angry with that? Some people get, might get angry with that. Well, let, let's say, okay, Thanksgiving, right? Thanks, let's go to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, there are certain dishes. I mean, there, there are certain dishes that you always eat on Thanksgiving. Let's say somebody has you over for Thanksgiving, but they don't serve the traditional Thanksgiving, you know, that, that sweet potato with marshmallows or whatever it is that people... You ever had that? Somebody, I've seen, yeah, I don't get the marshmallow sweet potato thing. I don't see. But, uh, but somebody doesn't serve the, the, you know, they don't get the turkey or, or, or the, uh, the, the, what is it? The green, the green bean casserole. Let's say instead of serving you green bean casserole, somebody serves you Hot Pockets <laughs> on Thanksgiving. You would, some people might love it. Okay, just think of the worst food that you would hate. Somebody serves you that on Thanksgiving, all right? The point is, you would be, you'd probably be, everyone here is pretty chill, pretty cool. You'd probably be polite, be like, oh, thank you for this. But you'd probably, you, I bet you'd feel pretty disappointed. It's Thanksgiving. We're supposed to have the dishes that we have. What are you doing? Uh, another example, and I've, I've experienced uh, this one pers- uh, firsthand, that uh, uh, if, if, if you don't tip, if, you, if you're someone who doesn't tip, right? say you have a very bad experience in a restaurant, you're like, they, they didn't just, you know, I should be taking money off. They should be paying me for this experience. Like, uh, but if you don't tip, uh, some people are, are so offended by this, you'll feel their wrath. You'll feel their anger over it. If you, if you don't, I mean, I think you should tip. I think you should probably, unless it's really, really bad, there may be a zero tip. I don't know. Has anyone ever done a zero tip before? I don't know. Never done. I did it once. I got in trouble. I did it once. It was so bad. I did a zero tip. Uh, uh, yeah, people, see, see, I've offended you. See, I broke, I broke a cultural standard. And, and I felt the anger of it in, in that moment, actually, I did. Um, what, about, what about a handshake? What about somebody, uh, um, uh, offer, you, know, you, you offer your hand out to shake somebody's hand, and they refuse to shake your hand. Now, if, if they're just a germaphobe, you might be like, all right, I get it, you know, you're sick, whatever, you're, you're a germaphobe. But let's say they just, they just won't make any contact with you. They, or you've got to give them a hug when they, they refuse. They don't, they're, they're so upset with you, so angry with you, they won't shake your hand. Or, you know, even a stranger, somebody you've just met, and they won't... It's, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a little bit offensive, maybe. Uh, someone won't shake my hand. Uh, another one, and I'll give you one more. Another one in our, our culture. Uh, politics has kind of become our religion in our, in our, our day and age. And some people view... Voting in, in very kind of sacred terms. You know, I mean, people will say, and I, you know, I agree somewhat with the sentiment, but uh, let's say, hey, people died for your freedom. So, you know, you need to honor that sacrifice and, and, and do your civil duty. You need to vote, right? Um, but some people, you know, so they, but they take offense if, you, if you're not engaged politically. You know, maybe they don't understand, like, well, I just, you know, some people don't know much about politics, or they don't know, or they, they don't feel confident, they don't like any of the options, so I'm going to choose not to vote. You know. but, but some people, I've heard of this before, some, some people getting very offended about people not, not voting, because, well, that's a sacred, that, isn't that something that you should do? I mean, people might have reasons for not doing it, people, it's on people's conscience, right? You can choose to not do that. The, the, what we've got to understand about the Sabbath is Jesus is stepping on something 
that was so highly important to them, they couldn't cope with the fact that he was changing the rules or the fact that he was showing them that they had misunderstood. And so the, the, the idea of a Sabbath is, Sabbath is supposed to be a, a, it's a holy day. That's where we get the word holiday from, right? A holiday is supposed to be holy day. So this is the idea that uh, when we think of something being holy, we think of it being um, sinless. That doesn't quite make sense because it's not like well, I can sin the other six days of the week and then on the Sabbath I'm not supposed to sin, right? That doesn't make any sense. To be holy means it's set apart, means uh, you know, I love God so much, my heart, I, I love God that I, I just want to use this for Him. This, this, this moment, this period of time, or this object, or these resources I have, I'm not going to use them for anything else, I'm just going to use it for God as devotion, as an act of worship, to honor, to, to, it's consecrated to God. And so a Sabbath is yeah, a 24-hour pe- period, a full 24 hours, once a week, where we step back from our normal work activity. So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do my regular work during this 24-hour period, and, and this is done because this is what God did. That's the main reason. We follow the divine pattern. God rested from His work, so we rest from our works. But it's not just following the pattern. God commanded it. Right? It's in, it's in the Big Ten. It's in, it's in the Ten Commandments. It's a big deal. God commanded, hey, you need to, you need to be Sabbathing here. And, and resting, and we, we need to rest. You know, we, there's a lot of divine wisdom in resting. We've got limits. Like, if you just keep going, you'll end up collapsing. You know, you've, you've got to pay attention to, to those divine rhythms of, of wisdom, you know, wisdom that, that God's given us in these rhythms to, to follow. And it was given not to be legalistic, not to be rigid, not to be something that, 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 that became a burden, but... It was supposed to be, it was given actually as a protection, as a blessing. It was given to help the people, to enrich God's people. This is a gift. The Sabbath is a gift to the human race to strengthen us, to help us. There, actually, there's many things that we, gifts that God gives us to help us prioritize Him or help us worship Him properly that we, we do. That. Let me help connect some dots here because sometimes you know, as a culture, we're not very good at resting. We work too much. We're always busy. We just have to fill our time. We're a very productive bunch, and so we have to fill our time. And if we're not filling our time with activity, then we're filling it with a lot of entertainment. It's one or the other. We're not, we're not always really truly resting. But uh, let me try and connect some dots here. So a couple of examples of other ways that we already rest, that we Sabbath. So one would be on, on coming to church, right? This is a consecrated moment. We're not anyone trading stocks right now. I hope you're not. You know, sending any emails or setting up Zoom meetings or having a conference call with anyone, you know. Whatever you do for work, are you doing that right now? But no, this is a holy moment. What does it mean that it's a holy moment? It means that right now, all we're doing, the only thing we're doing right now is we're here for God. We've stopped everything else. We've left everything else behind. We left our work behind. We left our house behind. We've, we've left, unless you, obviously if you're online, you're, you know, you're at home still. But yet the point remains, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully devoting myself in this moment to worship, to learn, to connect with God's people. This is a holy, consecrated moment. I've stopped all my other things, and it's just for God. The Bible tells us a couple other examples here. The tithe, right? The tithe that... The Bible specifically says that first 10% of our income, it belongs to God. It's actually, the Bible calls it holy. That, that first 10% is holy, which means it is the Lord's. You give it to God. So when we give our, our tithes, our, that, that offering to God, we, you know, some Christians get this backwards. We, we spend all of our money, and then we look at what we've got left over and say, well, I'll just throw in a little bit of change. And it's like, well, that's, that's not consecration. That's not an, a holy act. A holy act is to say, I love God so much that I'll give him the best, I'll give him the first of it out of devotion and worship. And then I, One more example, we, we, we talked about fasting last Sunday. Fasting is similar in, in this regard, that when we go without food, uh, as a spiritual devotion, we're saying, my body in this moment is only for God. I, I'm, not, I'm not using my body for, for other activity. I, I'm stopping my normal activity, and I'm, I'm taking a break from that, I'm, I'm Sabbathing, almost breaking away, and I'm consecrating myself. I'm just for God in this moment. This is worship. This is, how, this is the mentality, the heart habit 
the heart mindset or the heart orientation towards truly worshiping God. And when we, when we understand the spirit behind something like a Sabbath or something like coming to church or something like a tithe or something like fasting, when we, when we understand the heart behind it, we, we can do it out of love. We can do it because we say, yeah, God, God's everything to me. If I don't have God, I don't have, I don't have anything. I have, I'm hopeless. I get, you know, when we go off, get off track and we get in our own direction, our own ways, it's, you just get darker and darker and darker and you get into that pit and you, you come back to God and you realize, what a fool I've been. I've been so far away and now I'm back. And that's the light. Of course. So out of that love relationship for God, you say, well, of course I want to. You think about it like, like a human relationship, right? When people fall in love, right? You ever fall in love with someone before? Right? New, new couple falling in love. What do they do? I mean, it's not an effort to consecrate themselves to each other and, and, and to be exclusively for each other, right? A lot of the other friendships get pushed by the wayside. A lot of other time doing other things gets pushed by the wayside. Now, this is the most important thing that I'm pouring a lot of time and energy into because I'm all about it. Uh, well, hey, with, with, with God, we, we have this love relationship with him. And so it's like when I understand the spirit the relationship I have with God, the depths of it, and what he's done for me, and who I am in him, when I understand that, then these rituals, these habits, take their proper place. But you see, once we start getting harsh about it, once we start building up these rules and regulations and building up these religious habits, and we, we, we're judging ourselves, holding ourselves to a certain standard, or we're holding other people. Maybe we're, so, Some people are better at doing this than others, right? Maybe you feel like a bit of a, a failed religious person. Congratulations, you're in the right place. I'm a failed religious person too. Uh, but some people are really good at, like John Wesley, some people are very good, very meticulous at following all of the religious expectations and, 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 and habits. And, you know, you can do that well, but also you can get very judgy about that, Right? looking down at other people where they're not doing it as well as they should be doing it or as well as I'm doing it. We may, we may not say that out loud, but we can easily be tempted to think that. And we, we're getting caught then in the motivation of guilt and performance, and we're trying to justify ourselves and feel good about ourselves based on what we're doing, how well we're keeping up all these different things, how well we're spinning all these religious plates, and we've completely lost the heart and the reason, the purpose behind it in the first place. And for them, the Sabbath, which was a gift which God gave to, to bless them, to enrich them, to help them, to help them worship. It was a, what, what a gift that God would say. I don't, you know, you're not slaves. I don't expect you just to constantly toil or constantly work or have all the, and this is even before the fall of mankind, before everything got screwed up with sin. Even in that environment, God gave us limitations that we needed to honor and obey to say that we're not God. We're not God. He's God. So we Sabbath with that, 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 attitude, that mindset of saying, yeah, I, I, I've got to rest. I've got to hit the pause button on this. And for them, they've they gotten so messed up, so twisted. They so twisted the Sabbath. The, the religious spirit, the, or just the human spirit, took something beautiful, took a gift, and distorted it, and it became a burden. And so they built all these rules and regulations around it. They just kept building on top, on top. They kept, this became the central thing in their faith, is how to interpret the Sabbath, how to practice and keep the Sabbath. So a few examples here. They came up with some crazy stuff. They, they concluded, you're not allowed to carry a child on the Sabbath. That's work. Now, some people can't carry a child anyway, I guess if you're not very strong. But the, the point, I mean, how horrible is this? If you think that you had to get medical help, or you're having to walk somewhere, and the child's, or it's a small baby, or it's the child's tired, or, you know, your house is burning down, or you're not allowed to carry a child, like, what? This is the, the legalism of the, the human heart. The other, uh, another few examples here, they, they came up with a rule that said, uh, if an animal is giving, is, is, is in labor, you're not allowed to help it on the Sabbath. Now, Animals, you know, have, give birth all the time in nature and it takes care of itself and everything works out pretty well. But every so often there's a complication and certain people are trained and they know how to help animals in these situations. But if you, if you owned an animal or had an animal and they were having a hard labor and it was complicated and you could intervene and help them, apparently God doesn't want you to do that because that's the law. That's the Sabbath. You have to follow it. Also, if an animal got caught in a pit, you weren't allowed to rescue it out of the pit. 
Um, you, if, if, a, if a knot that had been tied has become untied, you're not allowed to tie it back up again. That's, that's work. Just tying a knot is work on the Sabbath, according to the Pharisees. Uh, sewing, you are only allowed to sew one stitch on the Sabbath. Two stitches is too far. That's work. One stitch, if you really must, if you really have to, you're allowed one, not two. It's kind of bonkers, isn't it? They had all these, if somebody uh, dislocated their, uh, a limb, a joint got dislocated, you're not allowed to reset it on the Sabbath. So you have to leave somebody struggling, somebody suffering in pain, just because you, you, you're thinking to yourself, you're disobeying the law. If your roof is leaking on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to fix it. If a building collapsed on the Sabbath, I feel like the, 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 the soup Nazi or something, or some, some kind of, no, or uh, Parks and Rec, isn't there the, the Parks and Rec thing of, uh, anyway, I'm, 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 my mind's making all kind of connections that don't make sense to other people, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, if, if you, so, so roof is leaking on the Sabbath, not allowed to fix it. Your stuff's going to get ruined, it's going to get flooded, that's a problem. If a building collapsed on the Sabbath, all you were allowed to do was to move enough rubble to find the bodies in the building to see if they were alive. If they were dead, you had to immediately stop. We can't do any more. If they were al alive, you could do the bare minimum to get them out. That's it. This is how, I mean, to us it sounds crazy, but any one of us is capable of building these kinds of elaborate rules and regulations and legalistic temperaments around God's commands, around God's words. They had forgotten, with all these rules and regulations, they had forgotten the spirit, the heart, behind why God had given it to them in the first place. And worst of all, they used God's word. They actually said this is, they, they used God's word to justify it. They're even undoing God's word. And so in the eyes of the Pharisees, there's probably two things that Jesus was screwing up in their eyes. One was, they had this other rule, uh, that, that you couldn't walk more than half a mile on the Sabbath, right? So this field was probably bigger than half a mile, so Jesus is breaking that rule. But also the heads of grain, taking the heads of grain and eating them. This is the other rule. And so according to rabbinic interpretation, and rabbinic law, Jesus is doing some, a, a criminal activity in these two ways. Now, now, the distance one, the half a mile one, they just made it up. There's no verse for it, no reference for it. That's what they just decided. Yeah, you, you, know, you could walk half a mile anymore, you're breaking the law. The heads of grain one, taking the heads of grain, this is loosely based off of a reference from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, but even their interpretation of that verse is bogus. So they're getting all mad and all crazy with Jesus based on something they made up and something with a really ambiguous interpretation to it. And Jesus, so, so this is the problem with, so, so how, how easy it is for us to do this. We get all mad with God based on stuff we make up or we misunderstand or we're all mad at God. That's what the Pharisees were doing. And so Jesus, oftentimes he responds in his own authority and he does at the end say he's the Lord of the Sabbath. But that's not his initial go-to. What does Jesus do? He points them to Scripture. This is a great lesson for us. He points them to Scripture. And specifically the Old Testament. And I, I love this because we're in a time uh, where Christianity uh, you know, is under attack in many ways, even from within itself, people taking it apart in different ways and trying to even disconnect or get rid of the Old Testament in different ways. And what does Jesus do? Jesus is like, yeah, so to, to, to correct your bad interpretation, I'm going to quote to you from the Old Testament. All right, that's what Jesus does. So the question is, what, what does God's word say? So verse 25 and 26, this is, this is how Jesus responds. And this is an example to us. If people have wishy-washy interpretations of things or overly legalistic interpretations of things, trying to add rules onto the faith and getting mad and judgy about stuff, we just have to come back to, well, what does it say? So verse 25 and 26, and he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need? That's important, underline that, in need. And was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the, the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any 
but the priest to eat. So Jesus is saying, yes, it wasn't lawful. And also gave it to those who were with him. So David, you know, who eventually became King David. He wasn't King David at this time. At this time, uh, this reference here, David's on the run. King Saul is trying to kill him. David's with his men. And, you know, they're hungry. They're desperate. And so they, they, they show up at the, with, you know, the priest is there. And what the priest would normally do is they'd make 12 loaves of bread. And it's called the bread of the presence, as it's mentioned here. And, you know, they had the, the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, they've got all this cool stuff. They've got this table. They've got some altars and some other stuff. And on the table, they would put around it 12 loaves of bread. And the idea was that, you know, as the people of God, you know, the priests sit down and eat with God. It's, it's a precursor to communion, actually. It's uh, the Lord's Supper. It's a precursor to that. So now it's opened up. Now we all get to commune with God. But back then, it was just the priests that got to do this. So it was law- unlawful for anyone else to do it. And so David shows up with his men, and there's a priest there. And David's like, we're hungry. We need food. And he wants to eat the bread. And the priest's like, well, you really shouldn't eat that bread. He's like, yeah, but we don't have any food. So the priest gives him the bread. Not only did David do something unlawful, the priest did something unlawful. The standard was broken. How was it broken? Now, Jesus never gives, I've I've mentioned this before and I'll keep mentioning it because it's so important. People want to use sometimes the way that Jesus breaks things or redefines things. People want to use that to justify immoral things. You can't do that. There's still God's standards. You know, lying, cheating, stealing, uh, murder, hatred, all these things. Hey, you know, we can't get away with these things. Sexual sin, that's a big one in our day and age, right? Lots of sexual sin around. We're all capable of falling into all kinds of different sin, right? So with sexual sin, just to get in, why not get into this? Be controversial, but, uh, you know, hey, you know, obviously pornography, you know, adultery, fornication. Fornication is... Sex outside of marriage, sex before marriage. Yeah, that's not fitting for Christians. It's, this is, hey, there are standards of what is right and what is wrong, and God regulates those things. God draws those barriers and those boundaries and says, this is what's good for you and this is what's bad for you. And, and you know it. If you're a believer in Jesus, you know it. When you cross those lines and you go into those dark areas, you know something doesn't fit right, something doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm, I'm walking in darkness, and it has a grip on me. It's controlling me. And I, but when I, if I repent of that and turn from that and I do it God's way, I know, oh, there's blessing in that. Yeah, it's better with my conscience. You know it. If you're a believer in Jesus, you know it. It's deep in your heart. When you, you may not like it, but you know it's true. So Jesus never, never makes those lines fuzzy. But, but, but according to when it relates to ceremony and religious ritual, Jesus is saying there's flexibility. There is flexibility. And then he caps it off in these last couple of verses here, verse 27, 28. He said to him, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Son of Man, again, very quickly, just in case you missed this in previous uh, messages that we've done this. Son of Man, Jesus, this is his favorite term to call himself. It's a callback to an ancient prophecy from the prophet Daniel when Daniel looked up in heaven and saw one like the Son of Man coming from heaven. So he's coming from heaven, so he's divine. He's coming from God, so he's divine, but he looks like a man. And Jesus is saying, I'm that man. I'm that man from heaven, the God in the flesh. And so he's saying he's, he's Lord of the Sabbath. We'll talk about that more in a second here. But Jesus is saying as he's defining the Sabbath, the Sabbath is designed to help people. People haven't been created to keep the Sabbath working properly In fact, the Sabbath has been created to keep people working properly. And so there's flexibility with it. So somebody in need, somebody is hungry, they need to eat. So well, you you adjust your your ceremony, you adjust your ritual because somebody's in need or you're the bread of the presence. Well, okay, it's it's against the law. Only the priest should eat this, but we have an emergency situation here. Well, the, the, the disciples are walking through a field and they're hungry. They haven't eaten for a long time. So it's like, you know what? It's okay to take a little bit of grain and eat that, even though it's the Sabbath, because there's a different value at work here. This is designed to help us. We, we have to understand what the Sabbath is for, for us to properly relate to it, for us to see that it helps us, it doesn't become a burden to us, that it's a blessing to us. The big lesson is that when there's a need, all the ceremony, all the rituals, all the habits, all the rhythms, all the practices, they become subservient to the need that's right in front of us. Because love of people 
always overrides love of ritual. Love of people always overrides love of ritual. Now, that doesn't mean we get rid of religious ritual. It doesn't mean we get rid of our practices and our habits and the and things we do. Because we, if we love God and we say, God's given me something that's going to help me, we love to do it. Because we say, that's a blessing to me, so I want to engage in it and do it the best I can. But if there's a need, the, tr- the truest way that I love God is to love other people. I don't, that's the order of values. Love of other comes before love of ritual. This is what the religious spirit struggles with so much. We try to justify ourselves. We try to prove ourselves. We try and be good to look good to other people, to look good to God, to feel better about ourselves. And we're getting it backwards. We're getting it backwards. The other thing that, I mean, fasting, um, not fasting, Sabbath thing. Sabbath thing is so important because if we don't rest, if we don't stop, our souls will slowly die. When you're younger, you can get away with it. You can cope with it for a bit. You can cope with long periods of, of work and no rest. But, but you know, the older you get, I'm, I'm telling you, the more you'll realize, because your body will start to tell you. But the problem is when you're young, your soul needs it just as much as when you're older. It's just when you're older, you, your body can't do as much. <laughs> So we, we, have to, we have to learn that, that from Jesus, grace-filled rest. Rest that is purposeful. Rest that is breaking from our, our regular routines, our regular work, and, but, it, but it's still flexible. It's still, it can be interrupted if it needs to be. If it needs to be interrupted, it can be. Because there are, there are, there's an order of values. But, but I'm still learning. And th- this wasn't their problem. You know, their, their problem wasn't overworking. I mean, we're in a culture that overworks. We don't know when to stop. We're just working all the time. We work way too much as a culture. We don't know when to rest. Even our city, the city of Chicago, is, has a culture, strong culture of overworking. Probably most big cities have that problem. The, their problem was rigid adherence to the rules. So maybe our problem is we overwork, so we've got to learn to Sabbath. Maybe our problem is we're too legalistic about the rules. So we, we actually, could you imagine trying to rest on the Sabbath if you're in a a religious community that's constantly watching every little thing you do in case you do something slightly that's not right. Or oh, I touched a child. Was that would I, what I was I moving them or helping them in some way? Or I thought about helping somebody in need on the Sabbath. Am I in trouble? You know, could you can you imagine trying to actually rest with that kind of weight on your shoulders in that kind of environment? Or see, see, we can overwork. We need to learn to rest. We can be too rigid about the rules and. And then there's still no rest in that because we're legalistic. Or you know, maybe we're just lazy. That's another category that's not explored here, but that can be a category for people. Are we, are we lazy? We've got a quote here from Alan Cohen. He says this. He says, There is virtue in work and there is virtue in rest. Use both and overlook neither. Use both and overlook neither. Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath. That means he gets to, de- to define it, he gets to explain it, and he gets to use it. Not the Pharisees, not us. We come in line with what Jesus says about it. For myself, I started trying to learn to rest and Sabbath. It was been several years ago I started this process, and I'm still trying to figure it out, still trying to figure out how to do this properly. But I became aware that I was overworking and, and, and not resting, and I didn't I had no clue how to do this. How, how do I even take a day off each week properly and not think about work and not try and do work and all that kind of stuff? And so I, I worked out my schedule where I cleared up a 24-hour period each week where it's like, okay, well, yeah, I'm not going to work. I'm just going to rest, and this is going to be devotion to God. And I got it on paper, so I was beginning to do it, but I was miserable. I was irritable, unhappy, obnoxious, wasn't fun to be around. So my wife's like, this is, I'd almost prefer for you to work on this day than to not work on this day. And so it was, it was a hard journey to figure out like, okay, when you start resting, when you start trying to take time off and ask yourself, am I, am I the kind of person that takes too much time off? <laughs> but, but trying to properly rest, it actually is so important because it reveals, it's more than just getting a break. See, see we're in a very therapeutic culture, so we, we, we tend to interpret Sabbathing and resting as, oh, I'm just relaxing, 
I just need to relax. Just a little bit of me time. It's like a spa time. And you might do things like that, but that, that's not really the point. The, the point is that when you, when you rest from your work, it reveals something about you. If you can't lay down your work, then it means your, all of your other activity in your work is being done with the wrong motive, and that was my problem. That's, so learning, you, only, you know that you've learned, you've changed how you view your work when you actually can lay down, you can properly Sabbath and rest. What it means is it means you're trusting God. It means not being anxious that you're not producing enough security and provision in your own life, but you're, you're able to trust God that the work I have done in the previous six days is enough, and I can trust God. I can trust that God's going to produce, that God's going to provide, that God's going to bless me, and God's going to help me, because if you can't rest on that day, then it means you don't really trust God. That's the sign. That's how this, this works. So it's more than just taking a break. It's learning to work differently. As we learn to work differently, then we can actually Sabbath and have that, that break that we so desperately need. Ultimately, it comes down to having this soft heart towards God that I'm not God. If I can't rest, then actually I'm acting like God. Resting and Sabbathing is telling God, you're God, I'm not God, I'm going to trust you. You're in charge, you're in control, you've got this. It's all going to be okay, I need to rest. I need to rest. But I'm also flexible with my rest because their love of other is more important than love of ritual. This is exactly what was happening with our friend John Wesley. Exactly his problem. On, I think it was May 24th, 1738. John Wesley woke up one morning in absolute despair, in, in toil, in torment. He woke up in the morning, first thing, just woke up in absolute despair and trying to follow all of his meticulous habits. Trying, he, he's reading the Bible for an answer, desperately praying for an answer, wanting to understand what is salvation? Am I actually truly saved? How can I have an assurance of my faith? Later that day, somebody invited him to attend a Moravian meeting. This is the, the group of missionary Christians he met who had that quiet confidence. And so he reluctantly went to this meeting. He didn't want to go. He was struggling. He was so consumed with these feelings of insecurity and uncertainty in his faith. But he went to the meeting. We have this quote from his journal. He wrote about his experience in this meeting. John Wesley writes this. He says, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. So that's Martin Luther, the great reformer. He's, they're reading some of, some of his writings. And he said, about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, up until this point, John Wesley was an ordained minister. He had a degree, a Bachelor of Arts from Oxford. He was devout in his prayer life, meticulously reading through the scriptures and Intentionally practicing good works, his father had been a minister. His mother had trained him in Christian disciplines. He'd been a missionary, for goodness sakes, doing all kinds of good works. Hadn't he lived a good life? Even with all those things, something was still missing. He did not understand that salvation is a complete gift, a free gift of grace through Christ alone, not through his work, not through his sacrifice, but through a sacrifice that was made on his behalf. No good work can save us. No ritual, no practice, no adherence to the rule of law can save us. Only faith. And God is delighted. God is happy to save anyone who will put their faith in Jesus. Through that heart habit of faith. Not the heart habit of the body, the heart habit of faith to say, I trust in Jesus and only in Jesus. We need to worship 
We need to let our hearts rest before him and allow him to do that deep work of grace in us where we can value religious ritual and practice that Jesus gives us, doing it in the right spirit, knowing that we're saved only by his amazing gift to us. This is the work that Jesus has come to do. When you like and subscribe, this video reaches more people.